everyone. Uh, before we begin, if you can, uh, if you can all please confirm that you can hear me and see the slides clearly by just typing yes in the chat window. Also, please feel free to introduce yourself, your name, your position in the company, and which in which country you are based in. Okay, great. Thanks for confirming. I welcome you all on today's webinar, which is Introduction to HSEIA Studies in Oil and Gas Industry. My name is Khadija, and I'm a technical support at Velocity. For the next two, two hours, it will be our pleasure to host this webinar for you. This is our 64th webinar in a series of technical webinars, and we are conducting as a practice once in a, uh, once in a month. You can follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and make sure to check our website to stay tuned and to, uh, to the latest updates. So today we have quite an experienced panel of speakers. Uh, I am with my colleagues, Mr. Ijazul Karim Rao, who is the Managing Director, Principal Integrity and Safety Consultant, Anthony James Williams, who is the Global Sales General Manager, Fizan Rahman, who is the Head of Environment and uh, Environment HD, HSE Department, and Sayeda Samya Aves, who is the Lead Software Engineer at Velocity. Dur during this webinar, we encourage you all to keep asking questions to clear any doubts. This, this can not only help you, but also many others who can usually have the same doubts. You can type your queries in the QA session, QA, QA window, and you will either receive a reply in this window or live. We will try to answer questions as much as we can during this session. Also, we, we will have a detailed Q&A &A session after the completion of the topic. Please, please accept our apologies if your question is not addressed. Due to high volume of questions, we usually receive. And given the limited time, we must be selective. For further inquiry, training, or, uh, or any other questions, you can contact us at info.glossyinst.com. We will be issuing participation to certificate to all those who have attended at least 80% of webinar and have participated in the discussion through Q&A. Okay, for the safety movement, before we begin, also most of us are in the comfort zone of our home, and we should be aware of emergency exits. Due to the current COVID-19 situation and its emerging variants, we should be more careful, keep a safe distance, and in general, take care of ourselves and those around us. Since this is a, tech, a quite technical subject, and today we will be touching key theoretical and practical aspects of uh, HSEIA studies in oil and gas industries in this limited time of two hours. We request you all to follow along with us, keep asking questions to help us in keeping this as engaging as possible. So today's webinar will involve a practical, uh, a practical case study. Please note that the client name and uh, client name and date have been rejected. We will be following a practical approach where we will walk you through the key steps for this case study. Now, so now I will hand it over to Mr. Fizan who will start today's topic. Okay, thank you so much uh, for giving the introduction and thank you so much all the participants uh, for joining uh, today's session, which are the HSCEA studies, in which we will uh, discuss or we will explain that what are the HSCEA studies, uh, which rules and the regulations uh, bound uh, us to carry ourselves in our studies, why they are important, and how they can help us to identify the hazards, impacts, or the health hazards as well uh, to protect our assets, environment, and the uh, health of the work that are working uh, in our projects, in our facility. So we will start uh, with uh, what are the HSCA studies. Uh, basically, uh, if you start with the HSCA definition, it's a, it's a systematic approach uh, that will help us to identify all the HSC impacts uh, that can be in the existing or uh, new or maybe uh, substantially uh, altered projects. And it helps us to establish the mitigation measures that are required uh, to minimize all those health, safety, and environmental impacts. So basically, it's a it's a uh, steps of or the chain of the steps uh, that are required to be carried carried out to identify all those impacts uh, that are required uh, to identify all those impacts and to mitigate them uh, either in the existing facility, either in a new or in a uh, substantially altered uh, project. Uh, HSCAA is it's a basically a living document. Uh, which will be uh, which will be required in each uh, phase of the project, uh, starting from the phase one, which is a concept stage or uh, at this uh, feed stage, then the feed uh, phase two, that is a EPC phase, uh, and then the phase three, that is the operation phase, and phase four, uh, that is a decommissioning and the disposal stage. So it is another uh, kind of a project uh, 
that normally require the HCA that is a uh, drilling and the testing of the flaring, uh, and that is a combined phase project in which we have to carry out HCA covering all the uh, aspect of the project or the phase of the project. But normally, uh, if I talk about the general uh, project phases, these are the four phases: phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four, which include the conceptual design and TPC stage operation decommissioning disposal. Uh, respectively. Now, what are the objectives uh, of the HSCIA studies? <clears throat> Basically, it helps us to demonstrate the compliance with the HSC regulation and the standard. Every country is having their own uh, HSC regulation and the standard, and basically, it helps us or uh, it demonstrates the compliance with the HSC regulation and the standard. And it also basically helps us uh, for the prevention plan for the major extent. Uh, major accidents and the HSC management system that are in place. It also helps us to identify uh, health and safety and environmental impacts, and it also helps us to record them and assess them. Either they are low, medium, high, uh, high, medium. So all these uh, can be assessed through the uh, HSCA study. It also helps us uh, to identify the environmental impacts and the risks that are associated with that particular project or the activity. And it also basically support us or uh, help us to basically identify all the suitable measures that are required. On-site and off-site emergency plans, plans have been drawn up. The risk of the project activities are allowed. Basically, it helps us to make the uh, all the risk into the alert as well. A sound overall plan is in place to safeguard life, property, environment, and the business. Basically, HSCA will not only help us uh for only the ace it is also help us uh, to the environment the property and the business as well because it help us for the continuity of the uh, business the importance of hsea studies yes uh, the hsea studies are very important basically because it help us uh, to identify all the major accidental hazards and that prevent all the uh, that prevent all the uh, accident that can be carried out that can be possible if we will not uh, implement all the mitigation measures. Uh, it not only helps uh, to prevent the loss of the money, but it also helps uh, for the uh, enhancement of the reputation as well. Because if any such kind of accident happens, then it will not only uh, loss of the revenue or the loss of the money, but it also uh, put the uh, company's uh, reputation on stake as well. So there is a one accident happened in USA in almost uh, in on March 23rd, 2005, which almost killed 15 people uh, and 180 people were injured. Uh, and the cause of uh, the accident is heavier, basically the heavier than air hydrocarbon vapors combusting after coming into the contact with the ignition source, uh, probably a running engine uh, vehicle engine. So this this was the source of such kind of accident that basically raise uh, or basically uh, provide the source of the accident and it almost killed almost 15 people and almost 180 people were injured. So basically it gave us a lesson that we have to identify all the environmental or the health and safety impacts and we have to uh, mitigate all those uh, impacts as well. The benefits of uh, HSCA studies. As we have uh, mentioned in the beginning uh, of our uh, session, uh, that the uh, HSCA study basically it helps to identify the potential HSCA risk. It also identifies the measures that are required uh, to mitigate all those HSCA risks and then the remove risk of unnecessary downtime. And it also avoids the preventable injuries because uh, if if we have a certain kind of a studies or the plans uh, that are in place, then it also helps us uh, the preventable injuries, injuries as well. And it also basically uh, prevent the environmental disasters. It also helps uh, to prevent from the loss of the containment, the spillages, leakages, which basically lead to the uh, environmental disaster. Standards and the regulation. Every country is having their own standard and the regulation uh, that are required or uh, that are bound for everyone, that are bound for everyone uh, to carry out such kind of a studies, uh, either either uh, as a as a HSCA studies or either with uh, with the other names as well. But the aim or the agenda uh, or the objective is the same uh, that we have to prevent 
uh, all kind of uh, accident we have to identify all the hsc risk that are associated with the project or uh, activity as well but here there are the some international uh, regulation uh, that is the uk health safety executive regulation uh, that are basically bound uh, directly or indirectly for every project proponent to carry out such kind of a studies so that uh, the hazard can be identified and we can mitigate all those hazards as well so the chemical uh, hazard information and the packaging for supply regulation 2002 the control of substances hazardous to health regulation 2002 reporting of injuries diseases and dangerous occurrences regulation 1995 then we have the transport of dangerous goods safety advisory regulation 1999 lifting operation and lifting equipment regulation 1999 the control of noise at work regula regulations 2005 the construction design management regulation 2007 the control of major accidental uh, accident hazard regulation 1999 control of vibration at work regulation 2005 and apart from these there are the other two standards as well which is under the uk health safety executive regulation so these are the international uh, regulations that are bound directly or indirectly to carry out such, such kind of a studies so that we can identify all those impacts and we can mitigate uh, those impacts as well apart from those international regulations uh, there are the client specific standard as well uh, for example the shell hsc standard we have the bp uh, hsc standard we have the adnog hsc standard and apart from these uh, client specific we have the iso uh, 13000 risk management standard as well so uh, here we uh, in the beginning of session we have explained that what is the hsc aa what are the phases of the project what are the objectives and the, what are the benefits uh, of hsc aa and the regulations in the standards as well now we are going to start with a case study uh, in which we have carried out the hsca study uh, for the sulfur handling unit uh, because of the confidentiality we have removed the client name uh, and uh, to some extent location as well uh, due to the confidentiality so this is the case study that we are going to present for the hsca study for the sulfur handling unit the case study uh, overview the location of the project overview uh, the facility that Uh, for which we have carried out the hsca is to convert the hydrogen sulfide uh, from the acid gas into the elemental sulfur and oxidize the remaining sulfur compounds to the sulfur dioxide and minimize their amount uh, prior to the discharge to the atmosphere so basically the purpose of uh, this project is to uh, convert the hydrogen sulfide that uh, comes from the acid gases to convert into the elemental sulfur and oxidize them to make into the sulfur dioxide less than 5 ppm b or h2s prior to the discharge to the atmosphere so this was the overall uh, project or the uh, facility overview uh, ammonia destruction to achieve the less than 30 ppm b of nh3 in the gas stream and the facility will be operating with a higher recovery of almost 99.9 weight or percentage minimum combined with a stringent atmospheric so2 emission limit as well so basically the purpose Uh, of this project to convert the sul uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, from the acid gases as uh, to convert the basically uh, to convert the uh, hydrogen sulfide from the acid gas feed streams to the elemental sulfur and oxidize the remaining sulfur compounds to sulfur oxide uh, prior to the discharge to the at atmosphere so this was the case study uh, overview uh, this is the location map Uh, project location map uh, for which we have carried out uh, the hsaea study <coughs> now this is the hsaea flow uh, chart the process flow chart uh, that how it works from where it starts and how it basically come to the conclusion part as well so uh, we will explain uh, all these steps in detail as well in the later stages as well but i will explain here Uh, overall uh, process flow chart uh, first of all we have to collect all the data from over the client that what are the data that are required uh, to carry out uh, all these studies so the first step the beginning uh, of the hsc that is a pha workshop the pha workshop is basically a process uh, hazard analysis or the assessment it has a uh, basically a three kinds of the workshop normally we carried out the first one is ohit the ohit is related to the occupational health 
of the workers that are uh, working in uh, on the project then the second one is the ended in which we have to identify all the environmental impacts that are associated uh, with the project and the third one that is a hazard uh, that basically help uh, to identify all the hazards that are associated uh, with the project through the uh, pha workshops that we have mentioned here that is ohid and mid and hazard we have to classify all those hazards uh, for example non m m a x non m a x mean major accidental hazard non m a x mean non major accidental hazards and the significant and uh, uh, non significant environmental impacts as well and apart from this the second one classification that is the mah major accidental hazard and the significant environmental impacts so all those non mah and the significant environmental impacts that will be <coughs> further assessed through the hscms health safety environmental management system and all major or significant environmental impact we have to carry out further assessment like ohra occupational health risk assessment environmental impact assessment then we have to carry out the coma control of major accidental hazard the coma is basically a constitute of the different uh, studies for example the qra quantitative risk assessment the fira fire explosion risk assessment isa and the era as well so all the mah or the significant environmental impacts will be further assessed uh, under the hsc studies which we have mentioned like the ora eia and the coma as well so uh, before going into the detail uh, we can take a few questions uh, so that we can address uh, parallel as well so that everybody can uh, understand okay one question is what about the hazard of salt in the environment and the relationship between our conference with salt industry see uh, adverse of everything is uh, uh, is not a suitable for the environment if we are if we are not taking care if we have increased uh, quantity of the salt then definitely that soil will not be suitable for many habitats so we have to take care all those uh, soil basically because increased soil quantity or the content of the increased soil that basically uh, they uh, alter the soil condition and that will not be suitable for many habitats so we have to take care uh, about the quantity of the soil uh, salt in the soil okay so we can uh, proceed uh, to the next uh, detail that is that is the hsca workshop as we had mentioned in the previous slide that hsca workshop is a pha workshop uh, starting from the ohid and mid and hazard as well so you can see basically the highlighted section that is the ohid and mid and hazard these are the hsca workshop or we also see it as a pha workshop as well uh, hazard workshop basically identify the hazards that are specific to the facility the end workshop basically identify the impacts of the project on the environment and the ohid workshop basically identify the health hazards and the risk in the workplace what are the health hazards that are associated uh, due to the project on the workers health that are working on the project that is basically identify through the help of the ohid workshop now we will explain further that what is the hazard workshop and how it basically uh, help or uh, how it carry out uh, to identify all the hazard that are associated with the uh, project the hazard basically is a hazard uh, identification is a workshop or is a qualitative technique uh, for the early identification of the potential hazards or the threats affecting people the environment asset or the reputation basically it's a quantitative qualitative a uh, workshop in which all uh, in which the people from all the discipline will sit together and they will assess that what are the hazards uh, that are associated and what are the threats that can affect the people environment asset and the reputation it's basically a brain shop uh, workshop in which uh, the people from all the discipline they sit together chaired by a one uh, person lead by the one person <coughs> and the brain shop discussion that how Uh, and uh, how the uh, hazard can be identified and what are the threats uh, that are associated uh, or affect the people the environment asset or the reputation uh, the objective of this workshop basically as we have mentioned before as well it identify the main hazards it also assess the severity and the likelihood 
it also uh, review the effectiveness of existing safety measures and apart from the existing safety measures if uh, if we need to increase the safety measure then we can also give the input uh, to increase the safety measures as well uh, these are the basically a example of the process hazard guide works uh, that are normally discussed during the hazard workshop for example the inventory the excess hydrocarbon had as it is material uh the loss of containment excessive process stress uh, release of the gas liquid toxic substances impact uh, process control failure structural failure, uh, failure erosion or corrosion uh, chemical handling like types specialized pps handling uh, and the protection uh, stored flammable improper storage operator error uh, defects impact fire mitigation measures include substitute non flammable uh, material minimize and separate inventory the source of ignition electricity may be the flare spark hot surfaces lightning or the mobile equipment so these are the uh, main uh, example of the process hazard guide words and their sources as well this is basically a flow chart uh, that explain the process of the hazard workshop that uh, basically carry out for the identification of the hazard Uh, the first one that is a uh, uh, is the hazard relevant to our project or the facility if that is the case then what are the sources of this hazard and where is the hazard located and then we have to identify the what are what are the worst case uh, credible potential consequences and then we have to assign unmitigated risk level for each hazard uh, then what are the potential causes then what are the control measures and then what after the control measures we have to assign all the risk again as a mitigated risk uh, based on the overall severity and then do we need to raise any further action then we need to add, add more recommendation or the control measures so first of all we have to uh, select either the hazard relevant or to our project or uh, operation of the facility if that hazard is relevant then what are the sources we have to identify all the sources and their location as well and what are the the worst case credible potential consequences and then after this we have to see that what are the unmitigated risk either it's a low either it's a uh, medium high medium or high we have to assign unmitigated risk level as well and then we have to see what are the potential cause and the control that are in place so based on the control measure we have to assign again uh, the risk level either it's a low medium because maybe before the control measure it may be the high but maybe after the uh, putting uh, the control measure uh, we can assess that maybe it becomes a high medium or maybe the medium so we have to assign uh, the risk level for both uh, unmitigated risk as well and mitigated as well and even after all this if we still we need to put uh, additional control measure then we can give Uh, additional control measure in the form of recommendation as well and then this chain or this flow chart or the flow will uh, continue for all the hazards uh, or the operation of the facility different com uh, companies or the different countries having their own matrices uh, to identify the hazard uh, but we normally use this kind of a matrix that you can see in your screen uh, starting from the notable uh, we can see the uh severity starts from the notable then minor serious major catastrophic and disaster so these are the major uh the severity level uh through which we have to identify all the hazards that are associated and then we have to see the uh, probability as well either it's a rare either unlikely possible likely very likely or almost certain so these are the probability level and we have to assess Uh, unmitigated risk as well and the mitigated as well uh, this is the sample worksheet that normally we use uh, in the workshop hazard workshop you can see that uh, the column first column is basically the hazard we have to identify all the hazards that are associated then we have to uh, basically identify what are the threats uh, and then the top event as well and the consequences and now you can see that the potential risk you can see there are the two potential uh, risk and one is the potential risk and the second one is the residual risk residual risk is basically after the uh, control measure and the first one the potential risk is basically unmitigated risk so we have to assess 
uh, all that is associated with the people, asset, environment, and the reputation as well. And then we have to discuss about what are the preventive uh, or the mitigation measures that are in place. And based on these control measures or the mitigation measures, we have to assess the residual risk as well. Either either it's maybe low, maybe medium, high medium, or high as well. And still, if you feel that uh, even uh, existing control measure or the mitigation measure, we have to put more uh, control measure, then we can give more uh, measures as well in the form of uh, recommendation. Uh, as this is a case study uh, based on the HCA study that we have uh, carried out for the sulfur handling unit. So we had carried out the hazard uh, for the workshop in which we have identified three high risk and then we have identified 20 high medium risk we have identified uh, 33 medium and 13 low risk. So this is the basically the summary of the hazards that were identified during the hazard workshop uh, based on the brainstorm workshop as well. The next one that is the uh, NBIT. Uh, basically, uh, NBIT is basically uh, look at the plan and the unplanned environmental impacts of the project on the environment. Uh, the planned environmental impacts are those which arise from the normal or the routine operation. Uh, for example, the operation of the generator, uh, the operation of the turbine, and uh, the impact that are associated with this aspect, that is the air emission. So these are the planned operations. So we have to identify the planned environmental impacts as well, and we have to identify unplanned environmental impacts as well. The un uh, unplanned environmental impacts are those which arise from the accidental scenario non routine operation for example the spillage is like it is loss of containment uh, so we have to identify the both uh, the planned and un, uh, unplanned environmental impacts as well the objectives uh, of the NBIT workshop basically uh, systematically identify the activities analyze the planned and unplanned environmental aspects of the facility it also identify all aspects of the environment and evaluate the impacts associated either again evaluation mean either it's a, a low medium high medium and the high then we have to identify that what are the control and the monitoring measures that are in place and if we need we need to put additional control measures as well to prevent or mitigate the impacts uh, to the allowable environmental standard and it also provides the uh, input to the management uh, in its effort to manage the risk related to the environmental issues as well <laughs> these are the guide words normally we use. As you can see that uh, these are the guide words which cover all the aspects or the components of the uh, environment as well. For example, air emission. In air emission, we have to further discuss about the gases, the particulate matter, fugitive emission. Then we have to discuss about the noise and the vibration associated with the uh, project. Then we have to discuss about the discharges to the water. Then we have to discuss about the liquid effluent. Uh, then we have to discuss about the waste, solid waste. Then we have to discuss about the terrestrial uh, or the marine ecology. Then we have to discuss about the visual intrusion. And apart from that, we have to discuss about the social uh, uh, impacts as well. So you can see that through the guide words, we, have, we can cover all the uh, components of the environment to identify the, what are the uh, impacts that are associated with the project. This is a basically a flow chart again for the end bits. Uh, first of all, we have to select an environmental aspect. Then what are the uh, sources? Then what are the sources of the aspect? And then we have to quantify all those impacts as well. What are the quantification, uh, impact duration, and the characterization as well? And uh, we have to identify what are the sectors uh, that can be potentially impacted uh, by the project activity. Then we have to evaluate the inherent severity of each environmental impact and list all the environmental control and the mitigation measure incorporated in the project design. And if, if the project or the residual impact is still significant, then we have to put additional control uh, or the mitigation measure to make them in a uh, acceptable standard. Now you can see that uh, this is a matrix that normally used uh, for identification of the environmental impact. We call it as the environmental impact severity matrix. Uh, it is used for the planned environmental impact. You can see that the left column, the severity, which is also starting from the notable, then minor, serious, major, catastrophic, disastrous, and the uh, disastrous as well. 
and the other part is the impact duration uh, either it's a momentary less than one week short term less than one year then the medium term uh, in between one to five years and then the long term five to ten years and then the long term 10 to 30 years and the long term more than the 30 years so based on the project uh, lifeline or the life uh, we can uh, identify the impact duration as well now this is the uh, unplanned uh, matrix that are used for the unplanned environmental impacts uh, this is the matrix corporate matrix of our client uh, again it is the same one that we have used uh, for, for hazard you can see that the severity is starting from the notable minor serious major uh, catastrophic and disasters and the likelihood is rare unlikely uh, possible likely very likely and almost certain this is the worksheet sample worksheet uh, normally we use uh, for and the workshop you can see that the first guide word that is the air emission in air emission we have to identify the aspects either the gases emission stack emission then we have to identify aspect the dust fugitive emission and other uh, aspects as well then we have to identify what are the impacts that are associated uh, with the aspect then we have to see what are the legal requirement either uh, what are the legal standard that are associated or we have to identify is there any other reputational or the community concern related to that particular impact then we have to uh, discuss about the preventive and the control measure and the monitoring measure that are in place and then we have to evaluate the significance of the impact after the mitigation measure so you can see that it's a severity and the duration either severity can be one or the impact duration can be a or then the risk can be uh, evaluated and apart from the mitigation measures or the monitoring measure that are in place if we feel that there should be an additional uh, control or the monitoring measure that are required to be in place then we can give uh, in the form of uh, recommendation so again this is the basically a, a summary uh, admit workshop summary in which we identify uh, almost seven medium risk and uh, 11 low risk under the plan and unplanned we have identified one high medium and eight medium risk as well so this was the summary uh, of the annual workshop that was carried out for uh, that particular project. Now the third one that is uh, OHE, uh, that is basically a occupational health hazard identification workshop. Uh, basically it involves the systematic identification of the hazard that are associated uh, with the operation of the facility on the proposed and also basically it, uh, it is an assessment of the proposed measure to eliminate, mitigate or the manage all those in uh, hazards that are uh, potentially can impact uh, the workers or the workplace. Uh, the objective is basically identify and the create an inventory of the ag agents potentially hazardous to health of the workers uh, that are uh, working on the project and then assess the risk to health associated with exposure to these agents and then decide on the control measures uh, required and consider an emergency measure needed to mitigate all those uh, acute or the chronic health these are the guide words. Uh, you can see that the chemical agents, the physical agents, the biological agents. So these are the guide words we use uh, for OHID for identification of the occupational uh, health hazards uh, in which we have to identify that what are the chemical agents, for example, the paints, then the physical agents, it come under the noise, hand harm, uh, vibration, whole body vibration, glare sources, optical non-ionizing radiation so these are the physical agent as well and apart from chemical agent physical agent uh, there might be a uh, biological ag agents as well so this is the basic, basically a matrix that normally used uh, for occupational health hazards uh, and then you can again see the severity and uh, the likelihood as well uh, based on uh, based on the uh, health hazards. This is the OHID worksheet sample. Uh, you can see that it's a, a physical agent like noise, vibration, heat stress. That what are the hazards that are associated associated with the project activity, and then the activity as well. And then we have to discuss about the route of entry, and that what are the health impacts uh, associated. And then we have to uh, discuss about the duration of the exposure and the frequency of the exposure. Maybe some workers 
are exposed uh, in more uh, duration, but their frequency is less. But maybe some other workers are more frequent, but their duration is less. So these all we have to identify <coughs> to identify the health hazard that are associated. Then we have to discuss about the control measure that are in place. And then we have to uh, evaluate all those this, uh, health risks as well. And then as we have discussed in the previous two uh, workshops, we have to give the recommendation as well if we uh, required to control or to minimize those health hazards as well. <clears throat> so this was the uh, OHID workshop summary. Uh, you can see that uh, it was high medium, only one was identified, the medium only nine uh, were identified and the low risk, uh, also the nine were identified during the uh, OHIT workshop. So the first step we have already completed, that is the HCA workshop uh, and the report that is the OHIT and uh, hazard as well. <clears throat> now uh, the next one that is a hazard classification. Uh, in the beginning, uh, while explaining the process flow chart. I explained that there are the hazard classification. We normally classify the hazard into the two category, categories. One is a non-MAH, uh, non-major accidental hazard and uh, sig non-significant environmental impact. And the other one is the MAH, major accidental hazards and the significant uh, environmental impacts. So before uh, going into the detail, uh, we can take a few questions as well if there is any and then we'll uh, proceed with the other part. Uh, one question, when EIA is only required and when HCIA is required? See, uh, EIA is normally, uh, is a part of the HCIA. So uh, to cover all overall aspects, uh, health, safety, and environmental aspects, we have to carry out uh, HCIA and the EIA will be the part of the HCIA as well. And now when it's required, it requires every uh, phase of the project. Uh, as we have uh, mentioned in the beginning uh, of this uh, webinar, that it will be required in phase one, which is the concept and the fee. And then it will also require to update in the uh, phase two as well, which is the EPC. And then the phase three, that is the operation. And the phase, then the phase four, that is the uh, demolition or the decommissioning. So this HSCAA will be required in each phase of the project, maybe in uh, starting from the phase one, we have to develop in phase two, we have to update. And then we phase three, we have to update again, uh, HSEAA. And if that particular project also required the demolition or the decommissioning, then we have to carry out uh, decommissioning or demolition HSEAA as well. Next question. What is the time frame for these HSEIA studies? Uh, if you are asking about the time frame, that how much time are required to carry out the HSC, it depends on the different factors. Uh, it depends on the uh, availability of the data or the information that are required to carry out such studies. But normally, it's uh, it's uh, five to seven months uh, or uh, is required uh, to carry out such studies. If AFF has foam discharge in discharging into the sea, is it environmental hazard because oil import birth having firefighting foam system? Uh, see, uh, again, uh, every country is having their own discharge limits and the uh, criteria pollutants that uh, what they can discharge and how they can discharge, what should be the limit. So it depends on their country limits as well. Uh, either either uh, it's allowed in their country or not, we have to follow all those uh, discharge limits and apart from uh, apart from the country there are the international rules and the regulation or the convention that are need to uh, that must be uh, followed uh, by the each signatory that uh, basically signed by the each country uh, for those conventions so we have to follow all those uh, accordingly next question is it mandatory the phase one hcia concept and feed to be performed before moving on to the phase two hcia who is responsible for the phase two HSEIA APC stage? Is it the company or APC? Uh, again, it depends. Uh, it's a basically a responsibility of the consultant. Uh, for example, the field consultant, uh, it will be the responsibility of the field consultant to carry out such studies. And it is also a responsibility of a uh, APC contractor or the detailed design consultant to carry out all those studies because without 
uh, without such kind of a studies, uh, the company or the client cannot give the approval uh, or or uh, you uh, or the contractor, if you see, or the feed uh, consultant, they cannot carry uh, or they cannot get all the permits if such kind of a studies uh, will not carry out. Okay. Uh, next question. Why do you use NVIT while environmental impacts can be done in hazard as we do in HAZO? Uh, see, again, uh, basically it can be identified in the end, uh, hazard as well, but that will not cover all the aspects uh, of the environment. The, the aspects that are required uh, to cover in the ambit that cannot be carried out or that cannot be covered under the hazard. So we have to have a separate session uh, for the ambit to cover all the components of the environment uh, as well. Next question. What is the effect of chlorine gas on the environment? Sorry? Chlorine gas. Chlorine gas. Uh, in the environment, again, uh, as I mentioned before, that we have to uh, see what are the emission limit or the discharge limit of each country. Uh, and then accordingly, we have to follow because it's, it's, it's not a safe or it's not a, a friendly gas. So there will be health hazards as well and the, uh, and the environmental impacts as well. So we, but however, uh, we have to follow all the air emission standard uh, limits that are required uh, before uh, emit into the atmosphere and to discharge to the uh, sea or other water body as well. Next question. Do we take probability of detection into account when conducting NVID? Uh, probability basically normally, again, as I mentioned that the different matrices normally uh, used by different countries. Uh, but the region where we are right now, uh, we have to see uh, the severity and the impact duration. Uh, but the probability normally we used to uh, discuss under the hazard, but not in ambit, but it depends on the matrix uh, that are need to be followed. And it can be vary from each region or the country as well. Okay. Uh, question before continuing. Can you please brief us about uh, SIL, how and where it works? Yes, the SIL uh, identification that we will, uh, that is uh, basically uh, a separate uh, session uh, that is normally not a part of the HSCA, it depends on the HSCA's identification accordingly. Uh, we will discuss this session in the, uh, this part in detail in upcoming slides as well, then it will be clear for everyone. So uh, before going, uh, what I was explaining uh, that uh, once we carried out the uh, HSEA workshop, then we have to classify all the hazards like uh, non-MAH and non-significant uh, environmental impacts. And then we have to uh, make segregation of the MAH, major accidental hazard and the significant uh, environmental impacts. So all the MAH and the significant environmental impacts that will be that through the HSC, HSC MS, that is a health safety environmental management system, all those can be uh, managed through the HSC MS and all the major and the significant environmental impact assessment need to further assess uh, through the further studies like OHRA, EIA, and the coma part as well that we will explain in the upcoming slide. So uh, identification of the major accident, uh, accidental hazards uh, basically, these MAH can be identified through the uh, PHA workshop or the HSEA workshop that we have explained before, which is a hazard ambit and OHID. Uh, identification of hazards from the hazard report as well. And through these workshops, we can classify the hazards into the major accidental hazards and non-major accidental hazards. And we can also uh, identify the significant environmental impacts and non-significant environmental impacts high occupational hazards and non high occupational hazards. Basically this uh, workshop basically help us to identify non MAH and MAH and significant and non significant environmental impact. Now, as I explained in the flow chart uh, that all non MAH and non significant environmental impact that will be managed through the health safety and environmental management system. So what is HSEMS? We will explain here. You can see that this is a highlighted section, HSEMS, we will explain in this slides. <coughs> uh, basically, HMS uh, is, a, uh, is a document, uh, basically, of the management system uh, that define all the structure responsibilities and the practices and the procedures that are required uh, to, min uh, to minimize all those uh, environmental or the hazards that identified during the PHA or the HSEA workshops. 
uh, HSMS basically provide the minimum uh, element which should be covered by each HSC activities. Uh, for example, the control procedures uh, like control of emissions where it basically HSMS uh, provides the control measure. Uh, for example, uh, emission to air, uh, PTW system, confined space, uh, control for working at height. Uh, so these are the basically an example of the control uh, procedures that are normally a part of HSMS uh, that basically help uh, to manage all those uh, non-MAH and non-significant uh, environmental impacts. Normally, uh, HSMS having different elements. Uh, for example, in element one, that is the leadership and the commitment, but are the uh, roles and the responsibility, basically uh, the senior management commitment. Uh, to control all those hazards uh, that are associated. Then the element two, that is the policy and the strategic objective. Element three, organization resources and the competence, that what are the organization structure uh, and what are their minimum competencies are required. All uh, this will be covered under the element three. And then the element four, that is the risk evaluation and the management. Uh, element five, planning standard and procedure. Element six is implementation and monitoring. Element seven is audit, and element eight is management review. Now we are uh, discussing uh, detail uh, of each element. Uh, each element one that is the leadership and the commitment. Under the, this element, we have the visibility monitor and the guide culture, proactive in target setting, inform involvement, and the code of conduct. In element two, which is a policy and the strategy objective, we have to have a HSC policy, we have to have a strategic objective and uh, dissemination as well. In element four, uh, which is organization resources and competence, uh, as we have mentioned before, under this element three, that what are the roles and the responsibility of each person, how many resources are required, the number of resources, HSC person that are required, and what are their competence level. Uh, to manage all those hazards. And then apart from these uh, personal or the resources, under the element, we have to have uh, a control measure to control the contractor and the supplier and the communication as well. Then there is uh, element four, that is a risk evaluation and the management. In this element, uh, identification, evaluation, control, recovery, and recording. So, but how we have to manage, uh, identify the, uh, hazards. Apart from that, how we have to evaluate and assess what are the control measures or the uh, are that are required or that are in place, uh, how we can recover and how we can record or report as well. Uh, element five, that is a planning standard and procedure. It also includes the HSC plan, asset integrity standards, documentation that are required, how many and how we have to manage the documents and what are the documents that we need to manage and the management of change and the contingency planning and the emergency procedures as well. Element six, that is the implementation and the monitoring. Uh, under this uh, element six, we have to see implementation, uh, non-compliance and the corrective action. Uh, if there is any uh, non-compliance, then how and what corrective action we have to take. Then the performance monitoring and the records, incident reporting as well. And under the element seven, uh, under the audit, we have to have an audit plan what are the competency level of the auditor who should take who should conduct the audit and uh, about the contractor auditing as well and the element eight is that is a management review uh, of frequency the management has to sit together to uh, to see or to review the performance uh, of the team or the management system either it can be a biannual or uh, annual as a minimum as well so now we are going to start uh, environmental impact assessment that is a part of the HSCIA. Now you can see that uh, the highlighted part that is a EIA, uh, which is uh, to see uh, all the uh, significant environmental impacts. As I had mentioned before that non-significant environmental impacts uh, will be covered or managed through the HSCMS and significant environmental impact will be further assessed in the uh, qualitative or the quantitative studies, which include the EIA as well. So EIA is basically a, a assessment uh, to identify the potential impacts from the routine and the non-routine operation. These routine and non-routine operation are 
the planned and unplanned environmental impact that we have uh, discussed in the ambit part. And then it also helped to uh, basically propose the mitigation measure uh, to control or to minimize the environmental impact. Uh, and apart from uh, EIA, it basically also uh, helped to define the management requirement as well uh, in the form of uh, construction environmental management plan. Construction environmental management plan is required before the start of the uh, construction then the operational environmental management plan, which is required before the operation. And if the project also having a component of the demolition or the decommissioning, then the DMP, which is a decommissioning environmental management plan. Uh, in this case study or in this project, uh, basically uh, what we did uh, uh, to uh, carry out the environmental impact assessment, uh, basically we have a project of the site specific data collection and the review, then we conducted the annual workshop and then uh, we develop a scoping report and then we uh, carry out or establish the baseline condition uh, through the baseline survey. Uh, some of the surveys we carried out uh, latest or some information uh, were provided by the client as well, which include the air quality monitoring, groundwater, soil, and the noise. And apart from this uh, survey, uh, we carried out some uh, modeling studies. For example, air disclosure modeling uh, was carried out, noise assessment was carried out, and uh, soil and the groundwater uh, assessment was carried out. And uh, after uh, that, we developed the environmental impact statement or environmental management plan as well. This is the basically a flow chart, uh, flow chart of the EAE. First of all, we have to uh, carry out the scoping that what are the scope that are required to cover under the EAE. Then we have to carry out a detailed environmental impact assessment. Then we have to uh, predict the, the impact that are associated. And then we have to evaluate all those impacts as well. And then we have to propose mitigation measure. And then we have to see either the impact is, uh, residual impact is low, medium, high, medium, or high. So these are, you can see that basically these are the uh, contours that we have taken from a disclosure modeling report uh, for a parameter uh, NO2 for one hour uh, ground level concentration. You can see these are the contours. Uh, that we got after the air disposal modeling for NO2, SO2, and uh, CO as well. And apart from that, uh, basically, we have identified the impact due to the effluent discharges. There was no direct effluent discharge was identified in this facility, uh, and there was no interaction uh, with the marine ecology, so there was no impact on the marine as well. Uh, the land and the groundwater with the existing control made the impact of the land and the groundwater due to the accidental releases as such uh, is insignificant. And then the impact on the noise atmosphere, uh, analysis of the equipment noise data in the existing baseline uh, noise data concluded that noise impact on noise quality is also low. Now, this was basically, uh, uh, we have to uh, basically uh, understand that the HSCAA is having a three parts. Uh, the one is basically an environmental part, uh, which uh, starting from the end uh, and then uh, we have to develop the environmental impact. And then the second part is the safety part uh, that basically includes uh, the QRA, the FIRA, the PRA, the ESA, and ERA. And the third part that is uh, basically uh, health related issues of the workers uh, that are uh, that are required to work on the project so the first part that is the environmental part we have already covered which is uh, starting from the end bit and then uh, just now we have completed the environmental impact assessment as well now we are going to start with the control of major accidental hazard uh, we call it as a coma as well uh, this coma or the control of major accidental hazard, it constitutes basically a different uh, studies. For example, the QRA, quantitative risk assessment, the FIRA, fire and explosion risk assessment, and ESA and ETA and some other uh, studies as well. For example, as 2 zoning uh, and the building risk assessment as well. So now we are going to start the second part of HSEA, which is the safety part uh, of HSEA. Now you can see 
the uh, highlighted part the right uh, red highlighted part uh, starting from the qra fira semop isa fira coma uh, the coma part uh, is basically a coma approach is a systematic procedure for identification evaluation and the documentation of all the major accidental hazards and the risk level of the new project existing or the uh, substantially altered projects as well uh, it basically helps uh, a preventive uh, approach to risk management as appropriate risk control and the mitigation measures are then to be incorporated and then the main value of the coma approach for existing facility and operation lies in the evaluation and the documentation of all major accidental hazards now these are the uh, basically uh, you can say that the flow chart uh, of the coma the first one that is a major accidental hazard that is a mah identification that we already discussed in the in the previous part and then the next step is the major accidental hazards uh, that is a, a assessment studies uh, as i explained uh, during the flow chart of hsaia that all the major accidental hazard will be further assessed uh, through the qra study through the fira isa era and h2s zoning as well now uh, as we have explained that the major accidental hazards normally identify uh, during the hazard admit and ohid and apart from this hazop as well uh, and apart from this uh, a bow tie workshop was carried out to develop the bow ties uh for the criteria for the identified mh uh, basically both tie is basically a representation of the uh, to the threats and the potential barriers and the consequences and the recovery measures uh, of the mh <clears throat> so basically these were the mh uh, that were identified for this particular project for which we are uh, presenting the case study the loss of containment from the acid gas knockout drum resulting in toxic gas dispersion fire and explosion consequence then the accumulation of the gas inside reactor furnace and thermal oxidizer that in the third one that is a loss of containment from tail gas clean up unit uh, including the piping resulting in toxic gas dispersion fire and explosion uh, consequence so these were the major three uh, major accidental hazards uh, that were identified for this particular project so this is basically a, a blow a uh, bow tie diagram uh, that was developed for this particular project that help uh, that what are the consequences what are the barriers uh, that are uh, right now for uh, that are not uh, basically helping to control or minimize the effect now uh, the second part of the coma that we have explained before as well that is a major accidental hazard assessment studies uh, it has a further study starting from the qra now we are going to explain the quantitative risk assessment uh, that it it's basically a quantitative assessment uh, carried out with the softwares uh, it can be through the safety or the fast as well uh, basically what is a qra it's a basically a systematic or the technical approach to analyze the risk uh, from the hazardous activities to form a rational evaluation uh basically the help so help us in order to provide the input to decision making process the, it, it this technique is basically used to derive numerical estimate of the risk either uh, it basically as uh, in the previous one uh, workshop it, it these were basically a qualitative studies uh, they give us the results uh, qualitatively like the low uh, medium high medium or high but basically the qra the quantitative risk assessment it gives us basically a numerical estimate of the risk uh, by the evaluation of the hazard frequency and the consequence uh, the objective is basically again uh, identify the main risk contributor to overall risk it basically estimate or quantify the risk associated with the hazardous activity of the facility uh, it also basically demonstrate the compliance with the regulatory risk tolerability criteria and also identify the safety critical procedures as well this is basically a flow chart uh, of the qra <coughs> uh, the quantitative risk assessment of step 1 that is the hazard identification uh, it also has a further uh, segregate into the three further step that is the failure case scenario uh, acceptable section marking on latest cnids then the static and the dynamic 
inventory sheet and the parts count methodology as well as per the OGT uh, 434. Then the second step is that is a failure uh, frequency analysis. The third step is that is a consequence assessment. It also has a, a further two step that is a thermal radiation effect level. Uh, these level uh, we will explain in the upcoming slides as well. And the fourth step that is a risk evaluation and the risk assessment as well. So from the QRA uh, modeling that we carried out, uh, that were extracted from the fast software, as I explained you that for the QRA, we normally use the two software. One is the fast and the second one is the surface. So for, from the QRA modeling, the following results extracted from the fast, the jet fire, that is a 37.5 kV per meter square, 12.5 km, uh, kilowatt per meter square, and the fourth, Kilowatt per meter, uh, kilowatt per meter scale. The flash fire, uh, uh, low flammable limit, and uh, the vapor cloud explosion, multi energy, and the BSC uh, obstruction method as well. Uh, the vulnerability assessment for human plant or the sector uh, carried out as per the OGP 434, uh, 14, and 15 standard as well. Uh, from the QRA modeling, uh, the following uh, results were extracted from the safety software. Uh, LSIR were uh, extracted, uh, IPA were calculated, or the societal risks were also calculated. <coughs> These were the consequences, uh, contours that were basically we got uh, from the modeling software uh, based on the different category, uh, weather conditions, 5D, uh, or different other. Uh, 5F, basically different weather condition having different results, uh, jet fire consequent results. So these are basically the uh, contours. These were basically the contours uh, for the toxic gas dispersion. Uh, you can see that again, the left column basically, or the left side basically, it gives the uh, results based on the different weather condition category 5D, uh, apart from 5B, 1.5, and this is the different weather categories and their uh, concentration as well. This was the basically uh, overall risk contour. You can see that uh, how uh, it goes far and how much is the risk uh, with respect to the distance and how they are impacting the uh, nearest uh, receptor as well. <clears throat> So this was basically a, a discussion on the QRA part. Now we are going to start uh, with the FIRA study report. Uh, the FIRA was is also basically a part of the uh, coma part or the coma, which is a control of major accidental hazard. And the FIRA is basically a, a fire explosionist assessment. Uh, introduction, uh, the fire and explosionist assessment is basically is a, a very systematic approach uh, to identify and assess the risk from the fire and explosion hazard that are associated with that particular project operation or the facility as well. The results of this assessment basically used to ensure the safe facility layout, specify the passive and active fire protection requirements, and it also basically uh, provide the input uh, for ESA and ERA. This ESA and ERA we will discuss in the upcoming slides as well. Then the uh, objective is basically uh, identify the potential uh, fire and explosion hazards that are associated. And then it also uh, helps to identify the impacts of fire and explosion on the plant. It also basically providing the recommendation to minimize the severity of the fire and explosion, uh, basically because it gives us the uh, input or help us to uh, basically uh, identify the requirement for the active and the passive. A fire protection system and assessing the opportunity to reduce the risk further from the fire and explosion hazards as well. This is the basically a uh, flow chart uh, for the FERA methodology. Uh, the first of all, identify, confirm any new MAH. If it's identified, then we have to carry out the FERA. Then we have to discuss about define the failure cases. Then we have to develop the inventory and analysis. Then we have to discuss about uh, confirm the physical effect modeling. Then, then we have to identify the uh, potential impact onto the critical equipment piping uh, or the structure as well. And apart from this, uh, there will be a further uh, two section that is a compare the fire the duration against the defined equipment and confirm the existing 
uh, congestion area if no change with the existing plant. So these are further assessed in the fairer methodology as well. So these are the contours uh, for uh, basically that normally we get uh, from the uh, from the FERA assessment, fire and explosion risk assessment for this particular project. Again, uh, basically it, uh, these contours were developed based on the different weather conditions that we have explained under the uh, QR. So before going uh, into the next uh, quantitative study, as to as zoning study, we can take a few questions more. Okay, here's one question. What are the data required for HAZIT, ENVIT, and OHIT study? There are the different uh, data requirements uh, depending upon uh, basically uh, each kind of a uh, each kind of a uh, workshop. For example, we, we have to see uh, the overall project description. We should have and what are the chemicals that are uh, that are basically uh, that are required to be used so that we can see that either maybe some of chemicals maybe are carcinogenic maybe are uh, more dangerous as well then we have to see uh, we have to have uh, information that what are the uh, discharges uh, that are associated either into the environment either into the land or the uh, water bodies as well and then we have to see the methodology or the method statement of the work that will be carried out so that we can assess that what are the hazards uh, that are associated with that particular project. Next question. Do you perform any kind of modeling related to environment or safety or mapping, etc.? If yes, can you uh, cite uh, how? As we have explained uh, in the previous uh, slides, uh, we have carried out air dispersion modeling uh, to assess the air emission uh, from the point sources or from other sources that was carried out through the air mod software. Then uh, as we have just finished uh, two modeling studies, that is a QRA quantitative risk assessment and the FIRA. These are also the modeling studies uh, that are carried out by the FAST and the SAFET software. So these are the modeling studies uh, that are uh, carried out as a part of the safety and the environmental uh, study. Next question. Does approval of the environmental hazard report indemnify the contractor from the future legal claims of, of negligence? See, it, it depends. Uh, it depends on the uh, type of the project or the location of the project. Uh, in some countries, uh, before the commencement of the project, uh, there are the different kind of a studies that are required to carry out. Carried out. For example, uh, the uh, ESA, Mumble Site Assessment, Phase One, Phase Two, Phase Three. So basically, uh, it depends on the location uh, and the rules and the regulation. But normally, where we are right now, uh, it, there is no such kind of a requirement. Yes, uh, before commencement of the project, uh, before commencement of the project, we have to carry out or we should have the latest baseline surveys uh, or the information so that we can establish that what are the current conditions. And after, after. Uh, closure of the project or after demolition, we have to have again the such kind of a survey again so we can assess uh, what are the conditions right now or if there is a worse scenario or worse condition, then there might be a legal uh, implications as well. Okay. Next question. In case of expansion projects, what type of ESIA is required? Is it required for the oil, old facilities or the new additional units for or for both? Uh, for the expansion project, basically, first of all, we have to uh, uh, we have to identify that what are the hazards as associated or the impacts or the health that are associated with that particular expansion, and then we have to integrate uh, those hazards with the existing facility or existing project. So, first of all, we have to identify uh, all the hazards of the expansion, and then we have to integrate with the existing. Next question, can we combine the worksheet for hazard and with and all it? See, uh, we cannot combine, we should not combine. Uh, we should have it uh, separate so that a better, in a better way we can identify all those uh, and we can address as well in a later stage because if you try to merge them or combine them, then it will be difficult uh, to identify all the aspects or hazards, impacts and the health risks as well. Okay, next question. Whether an individual HSC consultant can collate all the HSEIA dossier and get the approval on HSEIA from the company? Uh, sorry, come again. 
uh, the question he said here is whether an individual HSE consultant can collate all the HCA dossier and get the approval on HSE from the company. As I mentioned in uh, my beginning of the slides, uh, basically a field consultant or the field contractor or the HSE contractor, they are responsible to have a third party HSE consultant to develop such kind of a study because HSE must be developed by the a uh, third party consultant it cannot be within the uh, engineering or epc contractor they should or they must have a, a separate hsea consultant to develop the hsea those year to submit to the contractor and then subsequently submit to the company or the main project proponent to get it approved uh, from the project proponent and to the relevant authority so uh, the hsea consultant or the hse consultant uh, must be a third party consultant from the uh engineering or the epc contract okay next question what are the uh, threshold limit value for air, air quality and noise and noise thank you see uh, these are uh, vary from region to region and it basically uh vary from pollutants as well uh, for example if we talk about uh so 2 so it has a different value as compared to the no2 and both having a different value from the CO as well and the particular matter. So basically it depends on the region as well, it depends on the parameters and it depends on the duration as well because uh, one hour value, threshold value is different, 24 hour value is different and the annual value is different. So it depends on the each country and the region. Uh, next question. Is a CEMP workshop mandatory before start of construction of the project in line with the recommendations from the EIA report? Uh, no, workshop is not uh, mandatory. The management plan, the CMP management plan, uh, plan can be developed based on the EIA or the previous environmental study that developed. Uh, there is no as such requirement uh, for the workshop for the CMP. Uh, if if there is if a brainstorm discussion uh, uh, can be carried out, that's fine. But it's not mandatory. Next question: Is it possible to share HSE? HSE flowchart where 100% all HSE related plans, studies, workshop, etc. are covered. Bottom line, we can identify all HSE parts. Uh, basically, a flowchart, uh, it depends on the uh, project to project as well because some studies might not be applicable. Uh, some studies might not be applicable uh, on each project. So, uh, but uh, the presentable, uh, the flowchart that we have presented here, that is a general flowchart that is based on the uh case study that we are we have developed or we are presenting but the flow chart can be varied because uh, in some uh project maybe uh maybe a bra building risk assessment is not required maybe some uh fever or some other may be not required so it depends on uh project to project as well okay, last question before moving what is the difference between fera and qra how requirement of either of this is decided yeah uh, basically it be decided based on the hazard identification workshop if we have identified the uh, if we have identified the fire and uh, fire related or uh, fire and explosion related hazard then we have to carry out the fire uh, and explosion risk assessment and basically it helps uh, us to identify uh, the requirement for the active and the passive a fire protection requirement so basically it's a very mandatory study that are required to carry out because it helps us uh, to identify the hazards associated with the fire and the explosion and what we have to put in place uh, to minimize those uh, fire and explosion related risk and hazard okay so now we are going to start with the sqs zoning study report uh, that is also a part of uh, coma report or uh, that basically covered the major accidental uh, hazards uh, extra zoning report basically for the facility which handle s 2 s or areas that are classified based on the level of risk posed by the s 2 s we all know that s 2 s is a very uh, dangerous or very critical gas and we cannot uh, expose our workers or uh, facility uh, mainly the workers or the person around the project to the issue because it's a very uh, highly toxic gas. So basically, SQS zoning study help us to identify uh, how to handle SQS and also help us to uh, classify 
classify the area based on the H2S level of the risk posed by the H2S. Uh, the H2S zone classification identify the low, medium, high risk areas in the facility. You can see that there is a red zone area, which is a high risk of the uh, H2S, then amber zone, and then the yellow zone as well. Basically, uh, these uh, zones is basically uh, developed based on the toxic rates uh, if equal to the e to power minus 3 per year and then the amber zone and the yellow zone as well uh, according to their uh, risk level as well. So this is the H2S uh, zoning uh, study uh, methodology of the step. First of all, uh, as we have explaining before, that is the hazard identification, then the consequence as assessment, then and the toxic event. Then we have to see that what is the whole size distribution and the past part count, failure frequency assessment, non-ignition probability, and then OGP, this database. And then we have to see about the weather parameter as well. As I explained during the before, uh, during the FERA and the QRA, uh, that the controller basically developed based on the weather. Uh, conditions as well. Uh, then we have to see the estuary zoning, toxic LSIR, then the estuary zoning, practical zone assessment, and the recommendation. So now you can see these are the basically a zone uh, or the results that we got uh, after the estuary zoning uh, based on the weather uh, parameter. Now these are the next step that is a <coughs> uh, HSCS register and the performance standard. Uh, that basically develop as a part of the control of major accidental hazard or the coma. Uh, basically, HSCS registers are the equipment and the system, uh, including inbuilt software or any component of these, the failure of which will cause or contribute substantially to our purpose of which to prevent or control the effect of major accidental hazard scenario. Uh, it also basically HSC critical activity that are important in preventing events and then uh, HSC critical integrity activities, activities such as design, construction, installation, commissioning, operation, modification, repair, inspection, testing, all these are the uh, HSC critical integrity activities. These are basically a, a Swiss cheese model uh, in which we have to see what are, what are the barriers related to the HSC CCS. You can see that a structural uh, integrity process containment, efficient control, uh, detection system, protection system, shutdown system, uh, emergency response, and the life saving. Uh, this is basically a HSCS tag level selection method. Uh, first of all, we have to start uh, with the accurate uh, assessment of the specific HSCS. Then, downward HS, we have developed the HSCS uh, register, assess the register, and then we have to assess what are the uh, barriers that are associated. These are the basically a template uh, of the HSCS register. You can see that, uh, but we have explained under the Swiss model uh, that these are the, the left column, left side, that is a HSCS barriers starting from the structural integrity uh, process containment, uh, ignition control, detection system, protection system, shutdown, emergency response, and then further are the categories as well. Uh, performance standard uh, is a statement which can be expressed in a, either in a qualitatively or a, a quantitative in terms of performance uh, required of a system or the items of the equipment. The performance standard basically focuses on identifying the MAH which shall be used to align the PM plans to be carried out. Uh, the PM plans is the uh, basically preventive plans. Then the operational phase performance standard shall include the MAH required to test major and record the performance of the HSCCS. Now, uh, as a part of the major accidental hazards or the control of major accidental hazard, there were two more studies, that is the ESA and ERA. We have already covered so far the QRA, FIRA, and S2S. Now we are going to start with the ESA. Uh, ESA is basically emergency system survivability uh, assessment. Uh, we have to see that we have to assess that what are the uh, uh, assess the survivability uh, of the emergency system uh, to perform its design. Uh, the objective or the aim of ESA is to identify what are the HSCS for given facility. It also determines the vulnerability of this identified emergency. 
it, it vulnerable determined by the emergency system are fail safe or not and if not fail safe determined by the uh, by the redundancies are available for emergency system and then we have to consider additional list as well this is basically a isa methodology in the step first of all we have to discuss describe about the facility and then uh, mmh identification then hscs certification that we have explained in the previous slide uh, if the hscs is vulnerable to mmh then the safety study viva isa <coughs> then if the uh, hscs is fail safe then we have to uh, have a look into the hscs uh the things as well and if not then system not uh, acceptable and then we have to uh, carry out assessment again to make the system accept, uh, acceptable as well the isa study result that we have carried out uh, for this particular project uh, the emergency system fire and gas detection system you can see that uh, vulnerable uh, fire uh, fail safe position redundancy acceptance criteria acceptable active fire protection Accepted criteria, uh, accepted shutdown system, acceptance criteria, accepted emergency response, acceptance criteria, accepted emergency power system, acceptance criteria, accepted. Now the ERA part, uh, the next study that is uh, part of the coma that we are going to carry out or discuss in this study uh, or in this presentation. Uh, ERA is basically the evacuation, escape, and the rescue assessment. Uh, is that basically a goal based assessment where goals are set for escape, evacuation, rescue provision. Uh, an assessment is carried out to determine if these goals are achieved for the identify major accidental hazards. Uh, the goals are set to ensure that each aspect of escape, e evacuation, and rescue are designed uh, and performed effectively. And the objectives are to specify the impairment criteria of escape routes and assembly points. Assess the effect of the worst credible uh, cases, to evaluate and demonstrate the means of escape, uh, to evaluate the minimum uh, escape time to muster station as well. Basically, in this uh, in this assessment, you have to see that what are the escape uh, routes that are available, or either we have to uh, see that all those escape or rescue routes that are available in or design in the project, either they are uh, they are uh, enough, or we have to have more assessment or we have to change uh, all the evacuation escape or the rescue routes as well. Now, this is basically a, a flow chart or the steps. First of all, detection. Uh, under the detection, there is a large system, then escape, uh, assembly in the muster area, then uh, uh, roll call identification of the missing person, then it will uh, evacuation as well or the rescue. Basically, in either part, as I explained in the previous slide, is it basically assess what are the escape routes or what are the rescue uh, routes that are available or the evacuation uh, plans that are developed or designed. Are they enough or they need to change uh, based on the emergency scenarios? So this we have to assess in the ERA part. You can see that these are the basically a, a contour that was developed as a part of the ERA study in case of explosion. And you can see that what are the maximum <coughs> level of the explosion contour that leads to the area as well. So these are the basically the assembly points, impairments, uh, assessment with the vapor cloud explosion. You can see that what are the approximate distance that are covered, the time to sound alarm, and uh, the travel time in the minute, the time to uh, donate the escape uh, set, and the total escape minute. So these are the basically the emergency scenario and the area uh, from the process area and how much time are required so these all were assessed uh, in this project as a part of the era report now uh, the next part so so far we have already completed the control of major accidental hazard now uh, under under this part we have identified the assessment study now there is another part uh, of the control of major accidental hazard that is the allowed demonstration and on the MOPO activity. Uh, this alarm uh, of the moto, uh, MOPO uh, activity is it's basically also a workshop that are carried out uh, based on the uh, discipline, uh, different discipline that are need to carry, uh, that need to be available uh, basically. Uh, MOPO studies act as a basis for the permit to work system 
it is a crucial that an operation be stopped in time to avoid all types of losses by the human environment or the asset. Motor study helps to identify how the risk of the operation is increased and which of the critical actions requires a permission to operate. A MOPO is considered as a permitted operation manual as well. This is a MOPO matrix uh, that normally used in other regions of the country. Different MOPO matrix can be, but this is the matrix uh, that normally we use uh, for the MOPO workshop or the study. <clears throat> then there is another workshop uh, basically that uh, carried out for the alarm uh, demonstration. Uh, once the risk evaluation is complete, then appropriate distraction measures shall be identified to reduce the risk. Uh, further to demonstrate alarm. Alarm is the uh, allowable limit uh, as well. Uh, risk reduction measures include the preventive or the control measures. The key concept in using the alarm principles. Eventually, a point of diminishing returns is reached. Uh, cost benefit as well can be uh, used with uh, risk analysis as well. And then the emergency or the facility response plan, we have to review or we have to develop emergency response plan as a part of the coma report. Uh, the objective of the emergency response plan is to develop, implement, and maintain the management system which uh, when activated in any emergency situation. As a part of coma, a review of emergency response plan shall be carried out to demonstrate that the ERP is addressed uh, all the emergency scenarios that are uh, addressed or identified in the modeling studies. If potential major, major external hazard effects extended beyond the site boundary, then an offsite emergency response plan must also be uh, developed. Now, this is the occupational health risk part. Uh, I will just take a few minutes. Uh, to uh, discuss again the overview uh, in the in the HCE flow chart, I explained that there are the basically three components uh, of HCE. The first one that we have uh, discussed that is the uh, ended or the EA that basically detail give us detail about the environmental impact assessment or the environment, and then the second component of HCE that was uh, basically the safety part, and under the safety we have covered the control of major accidental hazard to address all the major accidental hazard and in that part we have discussed about we have presented about the qra we have presented about the fira we have uh, discussed about the isa ita sqf zoning as well and apart from these modeling studies we have explained uh, about uh, basically uh, the alarm demonstration and the mopo we have also uh, presenting about the emergency response plan either on site and off site and we have also explained uh, hscs register and uh, the performance standard as well now this is the third part and the last uh, part of the uh, hscia that is the occupational risk uh, health risk assessment uh, of the workers that are uh, working in that particular project uh, identification of uh, uh, health hazards in the workplace and subsequent evaluation of the risk to the health taking account of the impact. Uh, occupational health monitoring will be conducted for the identified SAGs. SAGs are the similarly exposure groups, for example, the maintenance, the operation, uh, and the other SAGs as well. The health hazards associated with the physical agents, chemical agents, biological, ergonomic, Physio, uh, physio, uh, physio, uh, psychological hazards as well, and the industrial uh, hygiene uh, monitoring plan. Basically, in this uh, assessment, uh, we have uh, collected the project and the site specific data. We had carried out OHIT workshop. Uh, then we have evaluated all the uh, health risks. Then uh, we have defined remedial action and assigned action parties. Then we have record and document all the occupational health risk identified and then the, we have prepared uh, the aura report as well so based on hce studies that we have carried out based on the environmental reports based on the safety part and based on the occupational we have uh, come up with some conclusion and the recommendation uh, for this particular project uh, all the major accidental hazards have, have been identified and suitable control mitigation and the recovery measures are proposed engineered and are implemented it is demonstrated that operation can be achieved within the quantitative criteria and alert levels are demonstrated all the potential significant environmental impacts have been identified 
equitably analyze and assess for significance and relevant control mitigation and recovery measures are being implemented all high and high medium occupational risks have been systematically identified and implementation plan that shows how the control mitigation and recovery measures for significant impacts mh and high medium high high medium occupational risk uh, occupational risk will be implemented and managed throughout the facility all medium and low risk hazards will be managed and controlled via existing hsc management system so this is all about the conclusion and the recommendation that we have uh, formulated as a part of hsc aa which include the three parts uh, in the environmental part the safety part and the uh, occupational risk as well so this is all about uh, the hsc aa uh, that we have carried out uh, for one project which is a sulfur uh, handling uh unit so uh is there any question we can take and then we can conclude okay one question from has it what risk risk scores are classified as mah see it depends on the uh project to project in the in the has it part uh, uh we have explained you about the guide word uh, that normally uh, used to identify uh, all or to identify that normally help to identify all the hazards that are associated so we have to use all those guide words uh, that cover all the uh, components of the project in that particular guide words maybe some are guide words are not applicable maybe some are applicable so we have to cover all the guide words so that we can cover all the aspects of the project next question what are the purpose of contours in fair what are the purpose of contours in in fair yes basically contour give us the graphical representation of the risk uh, and it also help us to uh, basically uh, identify that how much area are going to be affected by the uh, by this kind of a risk so basically a uh, contour give us the graphical representation uh, of the risk next question we are planning to add flare gas system in existing refinery how how we can start has it can we consider risk in construction or operation if it's already existing facility then uh, and there is no uh, construction then uh, existing facility will be considered no construction if it's already existing uh, and for uh, for this one then we have to have a detail that what are the uh, operation that you are carrying out then we can advise you further next question is hcia can be done during operation of plant phase yes uh, as i explained uh, in the beginning of the slide uh, in normally uh, for a new project uh, hcia need to be carried out before the uh, start of the operation and then it must be carried out every after 5 years uh, in our country or in our region where you are sitting right now it is a mandate that the project or the facility has to develop uh, again hcia every after 5 years uh of the existing operation but for the new project before start of the operation hcea must be carried out next question how would you decide on mah during the project phase yes uh, basically identification uh, based on the their as uh, risk level uh, if that is a, a high or a high medium then it will be identified as a mah major accidental hazard if it's a low identify during the phg workshop or agc workshop if identify as a low then it will not be considered as a mh next question when do you have to review has it if any process change or design change yes uh, the process of the design in both scenarios uh, it will be considered as a management of a change and then we have to have uh, again a has it uh, workshop session again next question what is ogp risk database yeah this is the ogp it's a international guideline uh, that basically all the oil and gas uh, companies are uh, following so this is the international guideline ogp uh, that are uh, normally all the oil and gas sector that are following next question is constructability workshop and cmops is part of hsc can you please brief it uh, yes uh, these are also the part of the hsc aa Uh, in which we have to see that what are the uh, simultaneously operation uh, of that particular project uh, it's also both are also the workshops that are carried out uh, that where we have to see that the simultaneous operation 
of the project and the hazard or the risk associated with that particular project. Okay, next question. Do you identify hazards for risk? Shouldn't high risk be given higher priority compared to high hazards? Yeah, definitely. If if it identifies uh, all the high medium or high uh, hazards or the risk or the impacts uh, identified, then we have to prioritize those because that will be considered as a MEH or the MAT as well. So we have to consider or we have to prioritize all those impacts as well. Next question. What is the frequency of air modeling? See, air model, there is no particular frequency of the air modeling. Uh, air modeling must be carried out as a part of the environmental impact assessment to assess the uh, air emission impacts. Uh, and uh, air EAEA is normally required before commencement of the project and at the after five years. How to handle unplanned HSEIA hazards? Uh, see, again, uh, unplanned uh, environmental impacts are those which are arises from the non-routine operation so it will and if it's considered as a non-MAS then it can be managed through the HSMS as we have uh, explained under the HSMS section uh, because it has uh, eight elements and in each element uh, each requirement is covered so through that all uh, low and non-MAS can be addressed and managed through the HSMS. Uh, next question. For HCIA study, can we also include neighbor company complaint and MSDs? Yes, uh, basically, uh, while while uh, evaluating the risk, uh, we have to uh, integrate the neighboring uh, facilities as well. Uh, for example, if if a plant, uh, if there is a one plant, uh, for example, if I talk about my current project, sulfur uh, handling unit, in in this uh, sulfur handling unit, there are the different units around these units as well. So we have to integrate the risk as well. And apart from this integration, we have to uh, check the uh, risks that are uh, contributed by the neighboring facility as well, uh, so that the overall risk can be achieved. Uh, next question. What is the sufficient period to monitor the air quality and noise in order to prepare the term of reference required for SPSI? Uh, basically, uh, normally term of reference is basically uh, is developed before the environmental impact assessment and it defines basically the scope of work for the EIA and if, uh, let's suppose if you identify uh, different receptors that can be impacted by the project, then you have to mention the location and the duration of the air quality monitoring in the term of reference. For example, if the project is a, con, uh, it is a con, uh, construction of the road, and in the construction of the road, there are the different receptors that can be impacted. So you have to monitor air quality uh, before the construction uh, as well at, uh, at those uh, receptors before the construction. And then you need to develop a monitoring plan uh, to monitor all those uh, air monitoring during the construction as well. So before uh, before the commencement of the construction, we need to carry out air quality monitoring based on the uh, receptors. And then during the construction as well, you need to develop a monitoring plan that will be implemented during the construction. Okay. Last question. What is the difference between high, high and high medium hazard or risk? See, uh, it depends. Uh, it's, it's basically uh, evaluated based on the, uh, based on the matrix. Uh, and if I talk about if I talk about uh, the end mid part, uh, if we see that the severity is more and their impact duration is more, then it means that the impact is high or high medium. If if the severity is more but the impact duration is less, then maybe it's a medium. So it depends on the severity, impact duration, the severity, and the free uh, likelihood as well. So it depends on the matrix that normally we use for uh, during the workshop. So uh, I hope we have uh, answered uh, all the questions and we really apologize if we miss any of the question uh, because of the uh, shortage of time and uh, a large number of the questions. Uh, I hope this session is very, uh, very helpful for you to understand the requirements and the components of the HSEIA. Uh, and apart from this, you can give us the feedback uh, of this uh, session. Uh, the certificates will be sent 
uh, to the participants who attended this uh, session to the email, the signed uh, uh, certificate will be sent to all the registered email address. And it is request to all the participants uh, to join uh, our uh, social media platforms uh, that are available on the LinkedIn uh, and other, uh, other professional platforms as well. You can just find out uh, under this uh, final, uh, you can see on our screen as well. Uh, and it's a request to all of you to just uh, get an update on our upcoming uh, webinars as well, which we use now to held on every month. Uh, so that will uh, depend on your discipline as well, because uh, the webinars that we used to <coughs> arrange, uh, it uh, varies from uh, each session to each session as well. So that will be helpful uh, as well to get an update. Please keep in touch uh, to our website and uh, our uh, professional uh, platforms as well. So again, at the end, I will thank all the participants for your actively participation and for your questions as well. If still there is any question, you can send an email to our registered email address and we will uh, help you uh, to answer your question as well. Thank you so much and thank you, take care and stay safe. Thank you, bye-bye.